Yeah, welcome everybody for High Performance Computing, Advanced Scientific Computing. The topic of today's lecture is Advanced MPI Techniques and builds on the lectures we had basically already in Lecture 2 and in Practical Lecture 2.1 which was then complemented with the experience and a little bit of more broad ideas of the aspects we learned in Lecture 3. So this already includes some of the more advanced topics today, including parallel I.O., including aspects like MPI communicators that we basically not really have touched to a sufficient degree. But before we go into the material of this lecture, let us review what we had the last time. So in the last lecture, lecture three, which was about parallelization fundamentals, we had an interesting concept called domain decomposition. So domain decomposition in a way stands for another abstract concept, but you see here in the examples um, that we have here on the left-hand side that of course domain decomposition can be then having a really practical influence how you to perform the parallelization, how you do the granularity of certain aspects, or essentially how you do a task core mapping and the mapping of the domain to different cores in the domain. So essentially the domain stands for something you want to parallelize. Let it be the ocean when you want to propagate waves. Let it be, let's say, the Earth's uh, surface when you want to have the water modeling or maybe also numerical weather prediction. It really depends on the application problem in a way. It could be also very simple matrix vector multiplications that we had the last time, or essentially here just getting the maximum of an array of 16 elements, which you then nicely can parallelize. So admittedly, this is a kind of conceptual topic. So basically you see here, the world can be always chopped down to different um, pieces. And we have seen that in the second part of the lecture that it's actually not that easy to apply this then in practice. So again, when you think about um, doing, for instance, the application example of this array, we think, okay, it must be a very straightforward. We have four cores available. It's a very trivial example. And we want to have the maximum of these. So I could kind of just chop this down into four different pieces. And all of them have the local idea of getting the maximum It would be then essentially saying that this is something what we want to do um, all. And with other words, this means that essentially the maximum that you have then computed in the local ones needs to be basically getting global. So there's one of the CPUs that needs to take a special duty that actually then from all of these locals, again, takes a maximum of this global. So conceptually, you would think, this looks pretty even, this pr looks pretty equal, but you see also that the max global of this four different, let's say max local ones is also a task. It's also to be computed. And of course it might be not that you know hard to do it, but in the way that we show it here, it might be another work that is not really accurately shown there. And this shows you a little bit already the interesting thing in this domain decomposition, we have here a kind of master worker scheme where you say, okay, there's a master that in the end collects all the different locals to one global maximum. But this is already something we call partly unbalanced. So the one with the master has a little bit more work to do than the workers. And this term unbalanced will play a more bigger role in this course again and again. So especially when we look in performance analysis, but also today we will start a little bit with the idea of thinking about what happens really when you do asynchronous MPI communication and when you would do this a lot between all the different cores, there could be also an unbalance due to certain factors. But let's stay a little bit to the domain decomposition. Another example that we had, which is often here quoted in the course for the GPU, um, you know, idea of doing many, many core computing really, is that you have this interesting idea of shopping down mathematical arrays vectors, matrices into different parts. But this shows you nicely that this is not the only thing. You also have to think about that there must be something you want to do with it. And let it be numerical weather prediction or let's say here just the matrix vector multiplication. They have some form of how they would compute over this domain. So you cannot just, let's say, naively chop down the domain into different parts and decompose 
you have to think a little bit also what should be computed. And this will be in the second part here, of course, much more evident. So here we have just the simple mathematical rule really, which is color encoded that, you know, entities from this matrix could be pulled down into these different vectors and then multiplied. And then you came out, come out to a very nice idea of how you can get this new, let's say vector A by just multiplying this. And you see independent was here an important role. But what about when it's not independent, right? So this is a notion we also learned in the fundamentals. Of course, this is beautifully parallelizable, independently parallelizable, but what about a physical domain? We said maybe a 3D domain that we have maybe on our world, right? We always say we can maybe, you know, have the overall domain then chopped down again into smaller chunks. And there we learned also, it must not be always a mapping from one CPU core to one decomposed tile. It again is now the point of the computing behind it. Do you need more computing power for one tile or the other way around? Do you have maybe a couple of tiles that could be dealt with with one processor because one processor can be very strong of having, you know, their memory available in a kind of shared memory way. And things would we have again, and again, all over the course. It matters if you have a coarse grain scenario, for instance, in the domain decomposition, think about the accuracy, the prediction accuracy of maybe, let's say, the weather forecast, or you have a fine grained de domain decomposition, right, which shows you much more, let's say, kilometers, uh, and but then, of course, on the different orders of scale. So these are all influencing factors, and definitively, it always depends on the application, how you perfectly do it. And then, of course, also the system available to you where you have the HPC system running. And when you do this, of course, we also learned one challenge. And the challenge was that you usually want to have the neighboring tiles to, you know, at least in the physics, often influence the situation on your particular tile as well. If you chop it down into different pieces, you're not independent. You're basically dependent on the other tiles around you. So the beauty, however, is that through, you know, physical laws and known iterative and uh, basically numerical methods, we have an idea of time steps. And this is what this essentially is alluding to, what we learned that last time. So we see here a very nice chop down that the T0 and T1, right, time frame of the, cifre, of the same domain. But we see also that the status of this particular fellow in the next time step, which is T1, for instance, significantly depends here on the neighboring in this time step now in T0. So in other words, the surrounding factors now affect myself here in the future. And this has a loaded aspect to it. That means I always have to communicate, I have to exchange variables. Let it be, for instance, the heat equation that we had, right? The heat dissipation in a room, as an example last time. So this heat that we have at time step zero influences the heat that we have at time step one, no matter how much time is there in between, right? So this is often in very little, let's say, um, seconds, even in smaller elements, even broken. But the point is essentially you have this dependency. We also learned that, however, we have big computing these days. We cannot usually put everything just on one core or let's say on one CPU. As we know, there are multi-core CPUs available. We are running out of space. So in this idea then came the hollow regions and the ghost layers where we said, okay, now I have the situation that I need my neighboring information in the next time step. And I can come to a situation which is a little bit like this. You know, I'm essentially want to compute this for the next time step, but you see, essentially I have access in my own memory, essentially here um, very quickly to those three um, which are around me, but this one is somehow already on the next domain on the next processor. So I cannot just go to memory and get the values. Hence, we use MPI in this regard to do already something we kind of using ghost or hollow layers, we fill the values in a kind of um, domain part, which is not really existing. That's why it's called ghost, right? It's a fictional area. You can imagine this would be an, an, an ocean tile that doesn't exist really coming next to it. Just to be ready to receive already in the last time step. So here in T0, I would already give the data I have 
basically from this around professor uh, processor, which is really on the other hand, and do MPI and put it actually in the field there. And then, of course, in the next time steps, you see the situation here, that nothing prevents me to have it then actually getting, uh, gotten out of this space because it's in my memory space now. I have to, of course, clearly um, define the ghost layers on my cell, and they're continuously filled each time step then basically from the other processors. And that's a key idea how to use it with MPI. So you see from a simple send receive or ping pong and a kind of task zero is doing always something special and all others are, you know, doing different things. We come to a more complex setup, more complex aspects for application developers to really think about when they want to have good applications. Another element which is important to notice is this part where you have lots of load imbalance maybe in the input domain. Think about here what we do for clustering, for instance. Clustering data sets where you don't know how the data set looks like, right? You see here a very sparse representation in the space, while here is a very dense representation of space of data elements. And when you cluster it, this needs much more computing than perhaps the other ones. So you basically want to have a domain cut, not in a precise medium here or middle, of the domain, but rather where is the computational complexity? So what would be the cost in computing, which you can maybe a little bit approximate with a clever and smart approximation scheme in order to actually put the domain in such a way that it actually leverages the most computing you have. So you immediately can imagine that it's not so easy anymore than just this beautiful chopped down pieces that we see here. And we have seen in previous earlier lectures that people even moving to um, octaedas, to different parts of domain decompositions, even to trees, which will also come back. From the theoretical point of view, which has kind of a practical influence, is, is essentially these two plots that you then see there down there. What we want to understand is, given that our domain, even if it looks equal from a certain conceptual point of factor, um, what it is, when it, you know, having more computing available, what can we do? And we learned there's this kind of two matrix that you should learn by heart. It's often an exam question. So one is a strong scaling and the other one is a weak scaling. So what the difference again, if you think about, we want to show the speed up here on the left hand side, there's one thing to notice in order to show the relatively speed up, we always go more higher with the cores. That's always what we want to do in HPC, what we can do because we have many cores available. But what we keep constant, or we say a fixed problem size, is really the number of particles, the number of ocean parti parts that we simulate. Of course, then you see in each of the different ones that we have here in the different color schemes, we of course have here different particles then in this example, but we keep it constant per course, right, by going higher. So this is now something we consider strong scaling, and you see also the more higher I put here the number of cores, you see more and more the message exchanges, the overhead, the ghost layers, you know, this is overhead to have always the ghost layers filled and lots of communication overhead will eventually actually will basically kind of have this kind of interesting area here that is very interesting to see because it differentiates it from pure linear theoretical scaling, if you want of saying that's what we could theoretically achieve by just throwing more cores on it. But it captures the essence in high performance computing. And this means really an application you cannot just take and throw them on large machines like exascale machines now appearing and just assume that the scaling will be linear. It's quite the opposite. You have IO challenges we will talk about today. You have different aspects of the communicators that influence the communication behavior that we also have today that all actually chimp in the problem that we basically have a tail of maybe at some point in time in this kind of relatively speed up. Still, of course, it's quite reasonable to do so. If you think about you would have serial computing, you're probably never ending here. When you think about that, we already here use 300,000 cores, which is quite much with an older machine. Think about what you can do today. Now, on the right hand side, you have um, the weak scaling. So what is this? If you think about what we just shown is basically perfect. You want to show with more processors, we do well and we talk about. But here, of course, um, the idea is a little bit different. If you remember, the idea was Gustafsson's law and saying a little bit then um, we, we actually don't want 
to have just always the speed up. We also want to improve in the simulation scale. We want to do more. You know, the more we compute, we just want to have not this the fixed problem size um, better computed. We want a variable problem size. And this is best explained, I think, when you think a little bit what it's written here. It shows it very nicely that you have, you know, thousand particles or uh, ten thousand particles per core, right, on this line. That means you're not only increasing the number of cores inherently, what you of course also do, you have much more particles to think about because with each core you add, you add much more to domain specific problems, which are the particles here that interact. And with this, you can simulate a much more challenging simulation. And uh, of course, with this, your problem needs much more computing. And hence you see here also, um, at some point in time, then the efficiency with a tail off here, we are already at, let's say, 450 or 460,000 cores, um, which is still, of course, a great benefit for this application to use so many cores. But uh, uh, after that, we see also then the, the efficiency is actually tailing off. So then the, the question arises: why I paralyze? Still, I think it's quite interesting to see. And then from the runtime, you see, of course, when I add more and more particles, more and more energy fields or whatever it is you compute between them um, basically needs more computing as well so it's no wonder that at some point in time also the runtime gets up um, but there of course is a question how much it gets it up and these are the kind of scalability matrix both that you need to show for an application if it really works well right so this was a recap on lecture three and we built on this material in parts but more significantly also as it is around mpi in the focus essentially on this MPI part that we learned in lecture two and shows you what more actually MPI can really do. Um, we fulfill with this a lot of promises we left in lecture two and actually our practical lecture 2.1 where we said lecture four will show you a little bit more of examples what you can do. It's not just collectives and the point-to-point -point communication, we can do much more. And we will show you this a little bit with the blocking and non-blocking communication. And to all of these aspects that you have here, there will be practical lecture 5.1, where I also will demonstrate this. So here and there, maybe from a practical perspective, this would be not completely obvious, but we will see how that materializes when we have the practical lecture 5.1. So here today, it's more a conceptual lecture showing you the idea of communicators, creating different subgroups, how it is done. I show a little bit source code, but much more here in this particular lecture, it is about the motivation of doing so. What is the problem if you do this Cartesian communicator? what it has to do with process topologies and the hardware underneath, not forgetting that we don't have just cores. We have network interconnected influence of performance. We have different hardware communication channels. So we look at things like inter InfiniBand interconnects, but also how essentially is your network infrastructure implemented? Is it a fat tree? Is it a mesh? Is it a torus? Or is it maybe something we call now dragonfly? So this was something we were looking in the first lecture then in the second is really um, an eye-opening point of thinking about that computing in high performance computing, of course, has a very traditional strong role. But these days we have big data, we have AI, we have lots of, let's say, new application areas where there are high requirements to I.O. While simulation sciences and, you know, physical laws, what we discussed already uh, to be computed with numerical methods had already always a big footprint in I.O. These days we have a, let's say, even higher footprint now of AI techniques using really uh, cutting edge technologies. And here one key technique is parallel I.O. And MPI supports this really beautifully with different libraries, different file systems underneath. And we look into this also from a certain standard perspective. So what are the communities using in their applications? There are two to be known, NetCDF, for instance, uh, is one of it which really make it portable, right? So you can use this file format then also on different HPC systems. And HDF is another one which we will look at. <clears throat> so with this, you have some learning outcomes really addressed, which means really we look into the scalable networks um, on data intensive workflows in the second part. Then of course, again, we reiterate on the domain decomposition, especially when we look in the Cartesian communicator how you communicate in a structured way across different cores. And we take our modeling of the ocean that you will also have in your assignment, uh, essentially then as a good example here. 
With this, you already understand quite complex aspects of parallel programming because the Cartesian pro communicator is really used in really production applications, of course, in a much higher scale to much different degrees of parallelization, but it captures the essence what you can do with MPI. And you see also that this has different abstractions. So the Cartesian communicator, in a way, is a kind of virtual abstraction from what is really happening on the course. And with this, you also need to learn to differentiate that, of course, still my network interconnectivity, the real cables, optical cables between the different cores matter and different switches and how you actually perform the cabling. That's what we also want to bring across here. So we start with this, with a, again, I think very trivial recap by now you know by heart, MPI is distributed memory computing. So we can skip here a little bit over and come to an interesting topic. It's called non-blocking MPI communication. I brought you a, a kind of topical, typical blocking communication on the top. So that's what you already know. Uh, essentially, MPI send receive. We have seen for every send, we need a matching receive. And these are the timelines of the different processes here. However, you can imagine that there are certain issues with it. So if there's load imbalance before, it can be that one processor is waiting quite long. Let's say here we see until actually the other processor even starts to send, right? A, a thing, something we call maybe a late sender. Right. So this means all this time, essentially, he cannot do anything. Right. This processor. And here you see then how this could be materializing then if you would have, let's say, a non blocking, because here it's really blocking the MPI receive. And when I put in the MPI I receive, I'm not really blocking and I can essentially then use time for something else. And we will also learn then when we do the practicals what the role of MPI wait is here, you can really then wait finally until we basically have the send, but you can use essentially in this receiving some time really to, to do more things, which is important against this, this kind of different, um, let's say, uh, ideas of how you can most exploit the machine in terms of performance, right? Um, in some cases, it's even overlapping kind of the communication with computation, as we would call it. Right. So this is an important factor as too. So you lose the machine to the most uh, extent. However, you can directly imagine with this by already seeing that in the most students eyes, this is not completely always obvious here. Um, it's a more complex topic to do this, um, not only because you need another function like MPI weight and so on, but also because you have to think more clearly now that everything is not like a ping pong that we had already. But these are things we also will look into in when we have lecture five and then also practical lecture five, one where I do some demonstration, then you quickly get the idea. But of course, I think it take away the message that this is also used in practice uh, quite often, especially for tuning. And um, also think about that, of course, you cannot just do it with our typical ping pong examples or essentially point to point communication as a point here. You can also have, let's say, a broadcast that is not blocking. Uh, which means you can have collectives which are not blocking, where this has, of course, maybe an order of magnitudes of impact if you think about the size of a communicator. So more on this in Lecture 5, just as an appetizer, and to be frank, that actually MPI is so much more than we just in had in Lecture 2. A much more practical aspect also, which starts conceptually, but then has a big impact in practice, how you program your application, is again this kind of communicator things. Um, so this thing that you just learned until now was MPI com world, right? And this was something the world of all processors. We don't really can control it. We just get it by MPI and we are happy about it because it gives us all the processes we have. But what about I need to have, let's say, different communication pieces again and again in a systematic fashion. And I just don't want to, you know, always specify these ranks. And in, instead, I just want to make it easier for communication and assign all of them subgroups. And I think a very clear example is kind of here when you think about um, this could be a domain name composition and you basically want to have maybe um, here different kayaks over, let's say, a competition scene going from left to right. And then you have to implement, you know, the iterative method of a guy on the kayak giving a push over this, over the ocean that we already know from us. Then I don't want to really, you know, 
select always is different ranks. I don't want to make the different speeds of this kayaks then uh, to differentiate here. I can clearly then think about this kind of communication paradigm when I have the subgroups. And the subgroups then essentially model the progress of the kayak over the tile of the domain, I would expect. And then this have a much more clear idea which ranks are affected by this kayak I want to simulate over this time. At the equal time, you also see one important part that you have to learn by it. Once you do a subgroup of the communicator or any other new communicator, your old ranks are not any more applicable. In other words, you're having a new communicator with new ranks. You see now inside this world of the different communicators, they all have different ranks because you now have essentially four subgroups. So, and this is things that you can do nicely here with, of course, MPI com split. But think about that this that you do in any form of com uh, computing that we have here seen on the left hand side. And what's always remains is still you have MPI com world, right? So the world of all the communicators is still available for you, but it doesn't reflect you now uh, or basically shows you now how you break it down in the different splits. That's why we have a new communicator for working on this and then using the ranks that I have in this. So how that could look like when we have an example that we will also look back in practical lecture 5.1 when I do some demonstrations. You see here, um, we have still the MPI com world. We can know the size of it. Now, when I was taught you the example I brought here, here it can be, of course, very quickly um, cut into four different pieces. There are four different colors. So when I have the world rank, um, basically here 16 divided by four, we'll be getting four rows. So I think a very trivial example. Now, also, it's important to see that once I split a communicator, I need the old communicator, the handle, so to speak, on all the 16 ones that I now need to, let's say, split to get four new ones, basically row-based ones. And then you basically see um, that you can, of course, give that out. And when we do this in the practical application, you see then also the difference from this, all these ranks and the rank size of these different communicators um, that we had otherwise just an MPI com world. At the end, uh, you have to also give this communicator free because you kind of allocate quite some, let's say, MPI runtime, so to speak, for it. So it's also important to free it up. Now, this is a, let's say, very trivial communicator, a bit more complex as a Cartesian communicator. And this is what I learned essentially from the last years because I also was doing this, um, you know, as assignment very often. So, and also here in this course, um, one of your assignment will be exactly to use a Cartesian communicator to actually simulate the ocean, as I was alluding to before. Now, the ocean has waves or fishing boats or sailing boats, and they go into one direction, right? And, you know, think about again, that you always want to have the boat sailing on the ocean, one step, one step, next time step. So in order to understand what rank is next to you, left, right, above you or so, takes you already quite some knowledge about the domain where you are. So that's why this particular one is, is very nice to actually have an idea about your surroundings that you have essentially inside this. And you can have it, of course, as a 2D or the 3D. Essentially, this is yet another communicator and nothing prevents you to do, for instance, the split in the other one or do a new communicator from the MPI com world to start a Cartesian. And assignment two will be all about it. So it's good to learn in this lecture and then also have a look at the practical lecture 5.1 again when we come back to this. Now the Cartesian communicator looks a little bit like this as an abstract notation. You would still have your different ranks, you know, zero till 11, which means we have your 12 different MPI processes running. So that's clear. Now, what's not so clear for us is where is which process aligned when I now want to do a domain decomposition. So this helps you with the mapping here, right? We call this a process topology, essentially giving the processes a space or a map really on, on your problem domain. And you could see that from your row and column perspective as an application developer, you would probably just see, okay, this is zero, 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 one, zero, two, and so forth. These are my tiles I want to simulate. And underneath are some ranks of MPI processes I actually in a way don't care really. All I care about is my application logic on this logical tiles I have here. And underneath should be some core computing things, 
But in the end, um, I don't care if it's 11 or 10, the rank underneath. So, and this, of course, brings it to this question, what is uh, or what happens if I just want to, let's say, have the ocean here that you see here in this example, and you make, as the kind of arrow suggests, a wave propagating from time step to time step over the ocean, right? To make it a more realistic simulation, you probably put that iteratively again and again and again and again. Of course, there would be computing inside, but what we also learned is the height of the waves. And here it's, of course, a little bit simplified that the height on this tiles of the waves will influence the height on this tile of the world in the next time step. So we need to basically every time step, and time step is a notion we also have to model. We will come to this in your assignment. It could be a while loop, could be a for loop, wherever you do it. But think about that, of course, this iterative behavior is a quite important thing here. And no matter what you do on it, it could be fishing nets that will be filled, like in your assignment, or a boat, as we have seen, a sailing boat, a fishing boat, going through the tiles in a certain order. They can change direction from left to right, maybe from up to down. So, and all of this could be encoded, of course, in one tile, but what and how do you do it when you don't know exactly what the neighbors are, right? How you would identify that you now have actually something what you have to send here to this kind of processor, which is essentially rank 10. And this is a beauty where the CAT is in communicator. It gives you exactly this. It gives you essentially the source and destination that you need for the next shift, as we call it. So you shift things through the CAT is in communicator. Another more compact representation is again this. You would have the ranks and your logical space. And that's how you would see it. But internally, the beautiful thing is that already the Cartesian communicator knows that when you shift in this direction, right, you can get this. You ask for it. You say, OK, I want to shift down there. Then it knows, OK, your domain decomposition has been ended. So there should be probably something like, uh -huh, I go back to the beginning. So the destination from my MPI calls is three and my you know, source from the MPI calls is seven. Um, which basically then gives you um, then the different idea how you can iteratively move from this, right? So the source is here and the basically the destination I want to send to is then this. And this enables you in each step, okay, I get my data from there, I send my data there. And this is for everyone. So 11, you see here, it's a source, it gets my data from 11, but I'm going to send my data to 7. Because, of course, you have to now think and move the switch. We're not considering one tile at a time. We do parallel computing, meaning we do consider all the times every time. And this is exactly where our communicator here helps. We have a dimension here from three times four. Of course, there are different ones. Here's another one with four by four, maybe, when you have your ocean here, maybe in the assignment simulated. How does it look on the source code again? Here's a message is I will demonstrate this. So no worries, this will be coming much more clear when I do this in the practical lecture. So just quickly, you have to say if, uh, you know, kind of communicate is periodic, you have to clearly put the dimensions in, um, reorder the ranks as is another kind of, kind of small parameter you can put. And then you have a Cartesian create out of the MPI com world as we already know versus splits, just that you have basically then the idea of how you really define it by the dimensions and so on. And then you can do, you know, getting coordinates and basically shift on those um, interesting elements that we just have seen with the source and destination. And you can always say um, how much and, you know, always make sure you have the right communicator 2D here, which is now a new created MPI com world derived Cartesian communicator here. And then you basically are ready for the send and receive. Important is for students to understand that the frequently asked questions really, it's not yet something doing in terms of message exchanges. All what I want to know is when I would shift zero and one to these directions, what source and what destination I have to put in my MPI. And here in the MPI send receive, then I require the source and destination, what I do. And of course, then I have to do it in loops to do iterative and so on. We will see that in much more complicated examples, but I don't want to do, overdo it here, I think, without having the practical examples. That's why we come back to it. The rest 
Also here in the next couple of slides will be a little bit performance analysis oriented where we have a complete lecture where we go into this a little bit more into deep. But always think about once the things we have just done with the mapping from processors to cores or processors to cores, then you really have different issues. You have to synchronize, you have um, the hardware underneath. And for these things, you really need, you know, different interconnects on the really cable perspective. So, and this is something which affects what we're doing. And also when you think about that, you know, we, we discussed about that we can maybe have some problems in synchronization, that there are some little imbalance so that some ranks are much more quicker than the others. You see here, for instance, the sleep maybe take longer. Still, you have some kind of communication elements where then do an MPI barrier to wait for all processes to finish when you, let's say, have different tasks for doing its different ranks. So also synchronization, um, let's say, MPI aspects you can do. And of course, if you look on this, we looked already on communication. We looked on synchronization here now, but there will be also MPI IO in the second part of the course. So just the dependencies on hardware a little bit. So this requires usually really network expertise, uh, deep down network technical experts. Always think about that we now shift the view a little bit when we talk about this. Um, when we think about how we now implement a HPC system that supports this kind of domain decomposition or the ocean, right? For doing so, we need a very good interconnect to my next, you know, processor next door to really make this on an iterative time scale and then having a speed up. And for this, you have hardware realizing this. And there could different, there could be many different topologies. Here's one example where you have different dedicated IO nodes, right? That do the IO. But of course, all the network traffic over the, all this course goes always through the different other cores. So inherently, you have network congestion, maybe, if you have always the same I.O. course, you know, overused. You have different torus to topologies. You have certain bottlenecks, which are here in the switches. You have maybe lots of compute cores, and compute gets more and more cheaper. So this is increasing. But on the other hand, the file servers have also the terabytes getting more, let's say, cheaper as well, but what still is very costly is the internet, uh, is the networking between them here, InfiniBand and switches, for instance, as an example. So this has a huge factor, how you build those switches, how you build the network interconnectivity. So essentially meaning also really hardware cables that you put in, how many of those cables you put in. Here's one example of a fat tree. They call basically this a fat tree because it has a full non-looking full bandwidth. You can see that there's lots of connections here and every other, let's say one switch on the next level has a full connection with full bandwidth to basically all the different ones on the next level. And with this satisfying the requirement, which is essentially supporting this leaf switches, which are then of course your processors in the end. So basically full to full network connection is always be possible without any problem. There's full, let's say network connectivity. This already requires, you know, that everybody's connected to everyone, like here with optical cables, right, which are actually quite costly and which contribute to the major part, which you see a little bit exploited here. The network interconnect is today usually the most expensive part, um, maybe partly also the GPU these days, but still also the network interconnectivity, the switches around it are basically very costly. Then the electrical cables, which then makes the the final connections to the processors are actually not that tough anymore. So that was a fat tree and, and this is very costly. So where are the ways around that costly part? You can reduce the number of connections, of course, a reduction of cables, which means you have, let's say, switches here, which maybe then have um, not so many, um, let's say, connections anymore. We call that kind of oversubscription here, one, two, three, because we have only two cables for six leaf uh, processes we want to really connect. So you immediately see the bandwidth is shared between all of these leaves. And in other words, it's getting slower. The question is if it really affects you, of course, in the applications and the applications partly can maybe also deal with it. Another way, which is more recently uh, also getting more and more use is this Dragonfly interconnect where you basically have more local and more global topologies um, to follow. So a kind of intergroup topology of certain choices and then one that goes over the whole, let's say, cluster out. 
And it is actually it's driven by three parameters, the A, P, and H you see here, which stands essentially for the number of switches, which should be as a recommendation twice as much as the number of processors, and then basically also twice as much as the global links. So you would have these switches, which have some certain local connectivity in the group, but also have this global connectivity to the whole, which is essentially um, often recognized as a cloud. But I think the move you see to this kind of more optimized way of doing uh, network inter interconnectivity, you would say here you really need the so-called non-minimal adapting routing that really works only um, then very well. Um, otherwise, you cannot really have this. And, and this and other topics are going to much more advanced network setups that we cannot really cover in the course unless we do a complete um, network lectures around it. But in a way, it's important. And there are other topologies which I just here go briefly to it because we will revisit them also in the applications. You can imagine a cube. Here is a 2D torus, which means every core is connected with every other neighbor in all basically very high performant ways, no matter which direction. So this is a kind of full 3D torus. You can imagine there is 3D torus available, available as well. You have seen um, the setup of some large machines. Here's, for instance, an older Ukraine machine, but it doesn't matter. They still have I.O. nodes, which are very dedicated for doing certain specific jobs, but then also the interconnect matters, which are connecting these compute nodes with the I.O. nodes, especially if you think about the second part of the lecture today, when you think about parallel I.O. So to, to finish, essentially, the first part of this lecture here, we have some communication optimization, which is an extremely advanced topic. You can imagine now that placing this is essentially NP hard uh, when you think about the execution units versus the really CPUs you have there. You have so many factors to put in the IO routing, you have the different hardware underneath, you have the application logic. So it's not that easy. Hence, it is a quite uh, very advanced topic that you could do. And we had done some work in this area, for instance, and just an example was that the performance gains were just one to three percent in our very trivial heat map application example. So it's basically very hard to justify so much work to do a perfect placement, to do all the approximations. And having a much more complex application domain problem than just this heat dissipation here of a maybe heating in the floor somewhere in the Reykjavik apartment, then essentially this is something where you have to think about the trade-off. Do I want to have this performance gains uh, when I you know, have just so many programming time in? Because I maybe have just more processors and you know, they make my problem anyhow quicker and faster to solve. In a way, that's really the first part I wanted to leave you on the table. Um, there would be so many more things to talk about, but we don't have, let's say, an infinite set of lectures. I end this lecture part with a video here, which shows again the importance of this InfiniBand interconnect, which is also something you really need to learn by heart and know by heart when you come out of this course. So let's go and think about this lecture. Video. It used to be that when you heard of high performance computing, you would imagine a monolithic mainframe computer filling a room and clacking away at numerical calculations. But that's not the case anymore. From simulations and modeling to machine learning, high-performance computing is now needed in almost every industry, and it's not done with giant computers anymore. High-performance computing today is achieved through the use of clusters of small servers. These clusters can be small, medium, or very large. But in all cases, the servers need to communicate with each other very quickly to operate in unison and achieve high performance. This is where InfiniBand started, but it did not stop there. Today, many different industries share the need for a fast interconnect. InfiniBand is the fastest networking technology available today. In a world where we have so much data moving and needing to be analyzed, the last thing the application needs is to waste valuable CPU time either transporting or waiting for the data. Instead, with native RDMA capabilities, meaning there is little overhead on the CPU, data can move between servers without distracting the CPU from the application. InfiniBand delivers business advantages and competitive leadership for any data center size, as it enables maximum performance from the CPUs and storage. The in-network computing capabilities of InfiniBand allow data to be analyzed while in transit, 
offering the best application performance and return on investment for cluster computing infrastructure. As a public standard, InfiniBand can be processor agnostic, supporting many vendors' processors and coprocessor technologies. InfiniBand also has the lowest latency of any interconnect, allowing data to make round-trip journeys in a fraction of the time enabled by other technologies. And InfiniBand can be deployed in many fabric configurations. From FatTree to Taurus, Hypercube, Dragonfly and many other topologies, allowing users to match the network design to their application's needs. What's more, InfiniBand products are backwards and forward compatible, meaning that prior and current generations of devices will work with the devices of tomorrow. This extends the life of past investments and realizes a much better return on investment than proprietary technologies, which require rip and replace forklift upgrades. So what good can come of clustered computing? Think about thousands of computers analyzing data and running simulations, helping us find cures for diseases that could not be found in any other way, or enabling machines to learn. Think face recognition, fraud detection, or voice recognition. Imagine a computer describing a photo or video to a blind person. Possibilities are being uncovered every day. The members of the InfiniBand Trade Association are committed to delivering the best interconnect technology and increasing the speed, efficiency, and scalability of high-performance networks. And through the use of these clusters, companies from around the globe are working to make the world a better place. To learn more, visit us at InfinibandTA.org. Okay, so that's all for the first part of the lecture. And see you after a short break in our second part of the lecture, which will be about MPI Parallel AO.